Thank you very much. Thank you. So on reflection, my professional career has been guided by a quote by Professor Michael Ashby, who's a renowned material scientist from Cambridge University. And his observation is that when humans make large load-bearing structures, they use dense solids like steel, concrete, and glass. But when nature does the same, she tends to use cellular materials, things like wood, bone, and coral. There must be a reason for it. And Professor Ashby is correct. These lightweight materials, these cellular materials that are filled with porosity, small voids inside their material matrix, are extraordinarily lightweight, but yet very stiff and strong and can absorb energy impacts. <clears throat> and the problem, the question for you, is why don't we see those materials more often? Why don't we see these in every product that we use? Is it because our designers don't have a vision for it? Is it because they just can't see the opportunity? Well, that can't be the case, because we've seen this in nature for so long. What I argue is that the reason why we haven't seen this is because we're limited by the way we make things. Our manufacturing technologies don't allow us to make these. We're constrained. They put boundaries on what we can achieve. So just take a moment and think about how we make things. It's led by, mainly, subtractive manufacturing. You know, where you take a big chunk of material and you selectively, selectively remove that material bit by bit to get to the shape that you want. And yes, there are a lot of other manufacturing technologies out there, like injection molding and, and forging and sand casting, but at the heart of all those technologies is subtractive, where you have to make the tool, the pattern, the dye, the mold. Now, let's take a moment to just look around you in this beautiful new space and look at all the things around you. All these, besides the organic matter sitting next to you, every object has been designed and manufactured. Think about its shape, its form. It's driven by the designer's intent, but it's limited by the way in which we can make things, the manufacturing technologies. I mean, just look at the chair that you're sitting next to, or sitting on. Why does it look like this when it could look like that? Well, it's because there's no way to make that, right? We can't take our machine tool and bend it and curve it into space to carve out the, the stuff that we don't want to get to the object that we do want. But this isn't some sort of graphic. This isn't some sort of CGI trick. This is an actual object, a physical artifact. So how was that made? It was made with an emerging technology we call additive manufacturing, also referred to commonly as 3D printing. And we choose the word additive manufacturing because it's the perfect juxtaposition. We're not subtracting material bit by bit. We're adding material bit by bit to create the shape that we want. So in additive manufacturing, we start with a digital model, and to get to the three-dimensional real object, we take that digital model and we slice it into cross-sectional layers, basically two-dimensional pictures. And we feed each layer one at a time to a 3D printer, and it makes that object from the bottom layer all the way to the top, layer by layer. I'll let my PhD student Amy Elliott and fellow TEDx speaker explain. <clears throat> this is a different video, so we'll go with this one. Uh, this is a great video of an extrusion process. We're actually in, uh, slowly extruding plastic layer by layer. And for you Virginia Tech fans in the audience, we're making a beautiful little hokey bird here, a miniature statue. Uh, now, there's lots of different ways that we can make things layer by layer. We can extrude stuff like a robotic hot glue gun wood, or we can inkjet parts drop by drop and fuse them with UV light. But the question is, with, uh, there's a lot of reasons why people are so excited about these technologies. It's because maybe they democratize manufacturing. They put manufacturing in the hands of the people so that they can really truly envision and make their dreams. People are excited about the digital nature of this technology, the fact that we could email files of products. It could completely change the way that we buy and consume products, much in the way that the MP3 play, uh, or the PDF has changed the way that we consume music and documents. But what really excites me about this technology is that it can completely change the way that we make things. It allows us to achieve and make those objects that we have always been inspired by nature. 
So, you know, we can make these cellular materials layer by layer. They grow like organic things do in nature, right? And it's not hard for our machines to do that, because really it's just a bunch of two-dimensional pictures. Making that complex shape is as simple as just printing a few ellipses and stacking them on top of one another. And this has changed the way that people are doing business and changing the way that they have their entire domains. So Bathsheba Grossman is a wonderful artist who has used this technology to make impossible shapes come true. She remarks that these, uh, this technology has changed her, her sculpture that hasn't really been changed since lost wax casting was invented 6,000 years ago. We're, making, we're rethinking the way that we do textiles. But in the engineering world, we can use these structures to start making those cellular materials. So yes, we can make this out of polymer, but can we make this out of metal? At Virginia Tech, we're working on a technology to do that. And what we do is we don't print metal, we actually are printing sand. We're using an inkjet printer to actually deposit not ink, but we're depositing glue, drop by drop, to glue together particles of sand. And when you're done, you, well, you recoat layer by layer with powder. And when you're done, you're like an archaeologist. You dig the part out of the, out of the sand to retrieve what you want. Now, again, we're printing sand here. And we want metal. So what we're printing is not the part. We're printing the inverse of the part. We're printing its mold. We take that part and take it back in time somewhat to a more traditional manufacturing process, metal casting. And as the metal fills that mold, we then can remove that printed sand to get to the metal shape that we truly desire. This material is extraordinarily lightweight, it's cellular, but it also absorbs energy from impact quite well. So our collaborators, Dr. Ramesh Batra and his PhD student, Kian Lee, have worked at making a simulation for us. So up in the upper right, you're going to see an explosion take place, and you'll see the material absorb that energy now imagine you're sitting, you know, this is on the side of your car, and you're sort of sitting here. There's three small, tiny defects that do occur. But let's compare that against a solid version of that same material, same mass, same cross-sectional area, same explosion. It doesn't absorb the energy. And there's a huge crater there, and I, for one, would not volunteer to sit on that side of that panel. Now, we can use this technology not only to mimic nature and bring that into our artificial products, but we can also use the same sort of idea to start helping nature and helping ourselves. So we're using a completely different layering process. Here, it's, it's processed really as simple as a projector. And instead of projecting a giant image, we use a different set of lenses to actually converge the image to a bunch of series of small images, about the size of a postage stamp. And when you do that, you can start making really small, complex structures. And what we're doing is we're making these structures out of a biocompatible polymer. We're making tissue scaffolds, objects that can survive in your body and that have the same porosity as bone, that match that bone porosity so it encourages ingrowth and helps your bone heal faster. It can be seeded with your own cells so that it won't be rejected. And as you can see, it's small. Features as small as three widths of a human hair. Of course, you can also use it to make very tiny replicas of your school mascot, <laughs> like our 8mm hokey bird, uh, for, well, just, just because we can, really. <laughs> now, we can also look throughout nature and look for other inspiration. For example, let's take a look at Citrus Maxima, the pomelo, a 10-inch diameter grapefruit-like fruit. This fruit is so large that when it's dropped from a tree, it has to you know, have some means of surviving that impact because you don't want the fruit to spoil. And so researchers have dissected it and found that, yes, this very thick rind has a cellular structure throughout it. But it also has fibrous network that go around its circumference, almost like rebar and concrete that help it absorb the impact. So how could we, do, how could we use that? So we developed a process, a technique here, where what we do is we're doing things layer by layer, but we design a channel into the part. And then we pause the print. And we lay down a fiber. And then we hit resume. Now we're embedding fibers throughout solid material, just like we would see. Now what we do is we want to do an experiment. So yeah, we can make cellular materials, right? We can do that fairly well. And let's compare its performance with fibers and without fibers. So when you put a compressive load on those structures, you see that with fiber gets you 1.7 times stronger performance than without. 
Okay, sorry about the graph. Forget that. The bottom line is you put 500 pounds on a piece of plastic with fibers in it, it looks like this. You put 500 pounds on a piece of plastic without that, it looks like that. Okay? We're talking about light weight. We're doing increased performance with absolutely no mass increase. But, you know, where else in nature do we see fibers? How else are they used? Well, in, like, ligaments and tendons and muscles. So we can start printing objects like this, where we pause, let's say, we start printing our, a finger structure, and we pause it halfway through and put our fiber in, and in one printed part, one single print with one tiny pause, we can start printing complex structures. And, you know, it has an opportunity to change the way that we think about bio-inspired robotics where we can start you know, making hands that do what we want, that look like what we see in nature. Let me share one final example with you before I leave. You know, like I said, there's so many reasons to be excited about this technology, one of which is this emerging idea that in remote locations, you might need, you know, where, where in remote locations where there's no way to resupply the area, you might could, uh, need a 3D printer in space. So let's imagine like a disaster relief scenario, right? Major natural disaster, no way to resupply the area because all, you know, all transportation lines are down, and you need to perform reconnaissance to actually search for survivors. What we could do is if they had a 3D printer at that location, is actually email them the solution to their problem like, let's say, in the form of, the, of a 3D-printed quadcopter. So what you see here is a fully 3D-printed helicopter. Without, besides from the motors and the rotor blades and the electronics, the entire fuselage has been printed. And you can see it has a cellular structure, right? We need it to be stiff, but yet we need it to be lightweight. And we can also use 3D printing to do some really complex tricks, like make it collapsible. This entire object is only two parts. The hinges are printed as one piece. And that's really cool, because yeah, it's portable, and yeah, it's backpackable, but we can also print seven of these in a single 3D print. But you know, the truth of the matter is, we're really excited about this product. But what we're more, really more excited about is the story behind the person who made it. So this is Cam Buss. He's a senior at Blacksburg High School. Let's give him a hand. And the, the reason why I brought Cam on stage today is because he sort of helps me drive home my last point. You know, what's really exciting about this technology, we've seen so many great innovations come in just a short time with the technology. And it's been coming from existing engineers. And to be honest, we, and this is myself, right, we're, we're, we're struggling. Because we're, we've been boxed in for so long about what the technology can and can't do, about manufacturing technology. It takes effort for us to think past those boundaries. But there's a new, uh, uh, a new generation of engineers coming, like Cam and his peers. This generation of engineers that have grown up with this technology, that have grown up with CAD, have grown up with making, grown up with Arduinos, they never had to face a world where those constraints existed. So yes, we have seen a lot of wonderful innovations with 3D printing and added to manufacturing, but we have, haven't seen anything quite yet. Thank you very much.